Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast and welcome into signing day 2021, the first of two signing days in the class of 2022. We'll revisit this in February, but this time we're going to go with the, uh, the the bulk of the class as Penn State has done so many times since that rule changed. They're getting uh, pretty much everybody in on, uh, on Wednesday and it, not a ton of drama, to be honest with you. This is kind of where we expected to be with a fairly full class, um, maybe a little bit to go with Andre Roy. We talked about that on the podcast the first episode this week um, with St. Francis, that you're going to get drama at the end, and I think that's what Penn State's going to get. So uh, USC is still in there. I'm sure Maryland's still in there as well. Um, that'll be something to monitor throughout the day. But we're recording this on a Tuesday afternoon. We're recording it with 24-7 Sports' Brian Doan. Tyler's on daddy duty today, so uh, we get Doan instead. That was the preference all along. Don't tell Tyler I said that. Um, but Doan, happy to have you on once again. Thanks. I, I heard that Tyler's making like some Stromboli's also, so that's good. Uh, that's funny. Uh, you got you got jokes uh, for 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 those not involved in the joke, and, and that means nobody outside of this call had some dough out. The dogs got to it, and it's Stromboli night is ruined. Um, but uh, we're here on Wednesday morning, hopefully joining you, uh, getting ready for signing day. Penn State, um, as it goes, at, or as we are recording, the number five class in the country by 24-7 sports right now. And got to say, pretty remarkable given what we saw in 2020 with a four and five record, given Penn State's seven and five record this year. Of course, a lot of this class built before the season, especially in that run in July. Doan, this class bucks a lot of trends and, and it's gotten Penn State in a really good spot. Yeah, I, I kind of disagree with the bucking of trends just from this standpoint. The way recruiting has gone now, classes are pretty much filled by the time the season starts and not just Penn State's class, but other classes, right? So there's not as much maneuverability. Um, not to mention, we Fitz, I, I think you and I may have mentioned once or 70 million times that Penn State's strength is getting kids on campus. And they were able to get kids on campus starting June 1st and they did just an outstanding job of recruiting once they got on campus. They still had the big whiteout win, which kids love. Um, the helmet stripe or whatever it was against Michigan should bode well for 23 class and, and atmosphere. And I just think that Penn State finally got back to what they should be doing in recruiting. And listen, this I get to seven and five, but, you know, it's very easy for coaches to explain to the kids why seven and five happened, particularly when Sean Clifford got knocked out at Iowa. And you see the guy that came in is now in the transfer portal and take Juan Roberson. And so I don't view the seven and five. Yeah, seven and five, you are what you are, whatever Bill Parcell says. But this is what I expected from Penn State. Do they finish top five? I don't know. But I always kind of expect like a top 10 class. And, you know, they had 18 months to ramp up to get kids on campus and recruit. And they did their job with that. And by the time, you know, people are lost with seven and five, I mean, it, it's to me, it was a very misleading seven and five. Well, I, I think I think I'm more talking about the four and five in 2020 or 2020. I mean, it, it's not obviously with with COVID year, everybody's throwing that out. But still, that's a long time to go with a, a losing record. And, and it just to me, it speaks to the legwork for guys like Kenny Sanders, Islands of Midas, that recruiting staff, Hunter Carson as well, that recruiting staff that they had to put in from January to, to getting to June 1st, because this this cycle was obviously crazy because you thought maybe the, the dead period would end and then they just kept extending it and extending it. And then finally, June 1st hit and they have to hit the ground running. You got to keep kids interested that entire time. And I think that's really where they made the bulk of this class is, is forging those relationships in the first six months of the year so that they could benefit in June, in July. And that, that July was just incredibly hectic, as you remember, um, except for the week that you went on vacation. Um, but it, it was really just a product of the work that they put in the first half of the year. Well, if the NCAA would change its, you know, dead period and Penn State would change the lash bash, it wouldn't conflict with my vacation. So they need to think about that moving forward. But in terms of, I agree wholeheartedly with putting in the legwork in the class, you know, for the first six months. Um, but one thing I learned in talking to recruits, not just about Penn State, but pretty much about every program was, yeah, they went four and five or five and four or whatever it was during the COVID season. But, you know, there were so many other factors involved that a lot of people just wrote it off and said, hey, they were just happy to play. It didn't go their way. Something wasn't right with the mojo at the time. But I don't think anybody held it against them. And then they got off to the great start, you know, this in the fall where, you know, they, they were ranked pretty high at one point before that Iowa game. 
And so kids didn't really have that chance to say, "Uh oh, what's wrong? It's not like they started off 0 and 4 and then finished 7 and 5. So, but you're, you're right in terms of the guys on the inside who you rarely read about. You know, everybody knows about the Terry Smith, Phil Troutline, James Franklin, Pry before he went, you know, whatever, just go down the list, right? But you really, it's the guys inside that really put all the plans together for, you know, meetings, Zooms, WebEx, whatever it is. And, and I think you're dead on with the job they did with setting everything up. So when June 1st arrived, things would go well for Penn State. I think that's where this class was built. It was also built in Pennsylvania, 10 commitments yeah. out of Pennsylvania, and that includes the two junior college kids. It'll be interesting to see uh, Tyrese Mills probably not going to sign on Wednesday. Uh, he's got some academic stuff to take care of. Maybe February comes along and he's in the class, but the, the way that it works now is you don't want to sign somebody that you don't think is going to get in, um, and that's something that they'll have to deal with eventually. Um, you look at the rest of the class, though, and that's where they build it. I mean, the, the studs, uh, obviously Nick Singleton, Drew Shelton out of Downingtown West, the offensive lineman. Uh, you know, you look at you got 10 commits here and seven of them are four star composite. And that includes J.B. Nelson, a recent addition to the uh, the four star ranks on the, in the composite rankings. So, um, you know, it helps that it was a strong year in Pennsylvania, but really just, um, I think, circling the wagons, getting everything back in in tight. Um, you know, a lot of these kids were home the entire time during covid. So you know, getting them comfortable with staying in state was such a big part of this, this class. Cause that's 40% of your class right there. Yeah. And, and I think, like you said, it, it worked out with a lot of guys being, you know, from in state and, and having some really high end talent in state, which, you know, that's a great starting point anytime. Um, yeah. I know people will be upset about Tyrese fear, Brian and I white, but at this point you're not winning them all. Um, and, and I think it's unrealistic sometimes to do that. I, I think when you kept a guy like Nicholas Singleton home, it's just immense because of just the talented he is. I mean, look, right now he's in the five-star slot for us. You know, we, we, we got a fan all the way out to 32, you know, come February, but he's in a five-star slot for us. And, and that speaks volumes because that means we think he'll be a first-round draft pick. And not too many running backs are first-round draft picks. You know, you usually get one a year. And so he fits there. But, you know, Drew Shelton – Went down to IMG. They were able to hold on to him. I, I think it's easy to forget that he started making some visits after his Penn State commitment, and they they kept him on board. Bo Prabula, who you know the quarterback out of Central York, I, I'm never going to doubt him. He can play quarterback, safety, whatever. I, I just think they'll find a place on the field, and and then you know you you keep going. You go into Philadelphia, and a kid that I saw the last two weekends, Keon Wiley, who's played some DN, played some linebacker. I am really excited to see what he is like when he gets in the strength program for a year and really can bulk up with what his frame does because he's so darn explosive. And again, Fitz, it's like you mentioned, it's a heck of a lot easier to keep guys on board when they're in your home state or, or close by from schools you you know that you have good relationships, schools you've trust, schools you've recruited, and that you know deny Dennis Sutton was a big one too, just in Maryland, but he's still, you know, he's in that circle of where Penn state needs to do well with some high level prospects. And I, I think they've done just a great job of in some instances, winning battles in some instances, staving some guys off. Cause remember at one time, Nicholas Singleton looked like Notre Dame or Ohio state also. So they, they've done a great job. And in the same breath, I'll say they've done the job that I expect Penn state to do. Well, I'm glad you said that because I think expectations are important here because you look yeah. in the last couple of cycles and Julian Fleming, uh, Nolan Rucci, those are guys that you you expected Penn State to, to – we thought Penn State led for at the outset and then you let them get away. You've got an eye white in this class. Nobody ever expected him to go to Penn State. I mean, let's the, you, you've covered him since, what, he was a freshman or something like that. He was and, at the Pennington School as a basketball player and receiver. <laughs> there you go. And 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 nobody expected him to go to Penn State. So I think the expectations are important here is, is that you did not have that big fish on the line and let him get away. Um, and that's Nick Singleton. I mean, that's, you know, obviously he was a little bit rated a little bit lower at the time of his recruitment and commitment. He just continued to to, to rise up and rise up. And I say that splitting hairs because I think he's always been a top 100 kid. Um, but this is the guy that didn't get away. Whereas the last couple of cycles before you sort of reinserted yourself, reinvested yourself into Pennsylvania, that's really what you get. And, and you get the, the, the big splash in Nick Singleton. 
Yeah, and, and I also think you have to look at the fact that, you know, in Philadelphia, they, they got a couple of really good players there, you know, whether it's Ken Talley or, or Keon Wiley, and we'll see how they do in the 23 class. You, you hear some promising stuff coming out of there. And, and I think one of the things that you turn and you look at is Terry Smith is now in Philadelphia. And, you know, I, I remember Terry when he was a high school coach at Gateway. And he always related well, and he had those great relationships out in Western PA from the Whippy old days and, and all that. But I, I think getting him into South Jersey, getting him into Philadelphia is a move that it, it paid a little bit of dividends right now, but I, I think it can really pay huge dividends in the next few years. Yeah, he's like the uncle that everybody loves. And then whether you're Pittsburgh or Philly, you're you're falling you're falling for Terry Smith now. So he's done a really good job. We haven't even mentioned Abdul Carter, who who may uh, end up yeah. Yeah. He may end up being the best one out of Philly, you know, out of that group. It was that question. And you and I have spoken about Abdul and, and he is a unbelievable freak talent, you know, six, three to six, four, two thirty five, And he runs legit, you know, four five, low four fives, we'll call it with handheld. But, um, he, you know, his agility and his ability to get up the field is kind of what you need, not only in the college game, but in the NFL game now. I think he's a guy that can, you know, if you want to keep him at linebacker, that's fine. I think you can do that. I think he can play edge. I think he can play with his hand on the ground. There's a lot of uncertainty about what his position is, but here's the one thing I'm quite certain of. If you tell him to go get that guy with the ball in the backfield, he's going to have success doing it just because of his burst. And he is a kid that is a workaholic in terms of training, in terms of technique. And, and I think you know, he's not a kid that does a ton of interviews. I mean, I had to go drive to Delaware Valley for a game last year just to, you know, start being able to speak with him regularly. And I think sometimes like that, kids get lost a little bit in classes because they're not as out there with interviews. And I mean, I just think if you're if you're Penn State or you're a Penn State fan looking at this kid on film, man, you're, you're just salivating because he's also a kid that physically will be ready to go once he gets on campus. Yeah, and, and you look at what Penn State did on the defensive line in this class, and I think he just brings you a little bit more twitch than you have. You've got yep. uh, Deny Dennis Sutton, who's going to be a, de a defensive end, who's you know a bigger guy. He does he does rush the passer. He, he's he's an all around stud. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean right. he's the top rated defensive player in this class for a reason. Um, he he's very good. But uh, Ken Talley is a guy that's played linebacker, a guy that could grow into a defensive tackle. Even I mean, you're just not sure where that where he lands. But in terms of being right. Uh, straight up twitched up. I mean, you look at the, the testing numbers for Abdul Carter. That's a guy that eventually, you know, I, I think you maybe let him le learn linebacker, let him figure out, but put him on the Zaria Fisher path and let him get to the quarterback eventually. And I think I keep saying eventually, but I think that's going to pay off for you. Yeah. And, and I, I agree. And I think the other thing you look at with these kids in Philadelphia is Philadelphia more than anywhere in the region is producing more and more D one talent and higher and D1 talent now, you know, in the last few years. And now you're going to have an opportunity to start building those connections again because Keon Wiley's heavily involved in Philadelphia. You know, these guys are going to go back and, and continually speak with other people, you know, some of the kids coming up through the pipeline. So it, it really, it, it should benefit Penn State on the field in the next year or two, and it should benefit them in recruiting for the next few years, even beyond that. And and I think you you kind of have the elephant in the room there that you've got a shelf life when it comes to Dion Barnes because he's a GA he's got one more year left so you can only lean on Dion for so long unless you bring him on for a full time position so you've got to have positive experiences for those guys and you've you've had a couple throughout the last couple of years but if you get you know uh, Carter and especially Ken Talley Ken Talley's just obviously a little bit more vocal than than Abdul Carter <laughs> um, so just a, a just bit. a teensy bit. Um, okay. So you get those guys good experiences. You, you can benefit for, for a long, long time. No, without question. And I think that's one of the reasons that you kind of move Terry Smith into Philadelphia, too, to, to kind of start building those relationships. But listen, if Deion Barnes is recruiting well, you know, I, I get, you know, he's a defensive lineman. That's his supposed area of expertise. But in today's day and age and, and how coaching staffs are structured, Listen, man, just if you think he's that good recruiting, you think he's going to be a good coach, then find a way to get him on your staff when when it's time to get him on your staff. I, I don't think, you know, it's like, OK, he's done after his two years of grad school. Uh, you know, I'm sure he's getting his master's and attending classes all the time like they do at all the schools. But at the end of the day, find a spot for him on staff. 
Well, you, we talk about the uh, the facilities arms race. It's also a staffing arms race where you're trying to figure oh, out where to get these that, guys. Yeah, that, that is so much. I, I've never had a kid tell me he's gone to a school because of facilities, but I've had a zillion tell me they've gone to a school because of coaches. Coaches are going to be interesting because next, I mean, just even in the next couple of days, I mean, you might see movement all over the country. Uh, we saw a ton, you know, in the last two weeks with, between the end of the season and signing day, but still um, it's going to be, it's going to be nuts. Yeah. Can you define might when you say we might see it? Can you define might? That's a qualifier that leaves me time to wiggle out of it just in case it doesn't happen, which, <laughs> you know, we really expect that to happen. I mean, in, unless something's changed from the last 30 signing days, Come Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there's going to be shifting all over the place on the college landscape. You, you think, you know, for the Penn State folks, and I'm not saying he's taking anybody from Penn State, but but for, for the Penn State folks, as I knock my laptop, I'm so excited. But you, you think Brent Pry's like, oh, I'm just not going to hire anybody until February or or you think Tony Gallagher at UVA is not hiring anybody and everybody they hire, none of them have jobs at other schools right now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's going to be a bunch of movement. Yeah, it's going to be a bunch of movement. I feel I feel for some of those kids, but you know that's that's kind of the game these days. It's, it's the unfortunate side, you know, of things. I I feel a lot less for the kids now, knowing that they can jump into the portal and go anywhere they want. Yep, that was my next point. So, um, you, you look around this class, and there's guys that pop up, especially in your region. Um, you know, I think that it's it's really interesting to look at a guy like JB Nelson. And I know you, you don't do the junior college rankings. We have uh, folks that are doing that, right. um, but JB Nelson. I only do them if we're good. If we agree with them, then I did it. Yeah, yeah, right. Two, two years from now, if JV Nelson's an All-American, don't. That's a heck of an evaluation. Um, but <laughs> we recently bumped him to four-star status on uh, on twenty four seven Sports, and the composite caught up as well. Nelson's really interesting because he's six five. We haven't listed six six. He's not six six. He's six five. Um, he's got decent length. I'm I'm curious. I think in an ideal world, he's a guard, but he, yeah. he seems to have reshaped himself a little bit. Maybe you get into that right tackle type mold. Um, but he really showed some good things in that second year at Lackawanna. Yeah, and and I think you know before we talk about JB Nelson, you and I should take a bow for Juwan Brisker because. Uh, or Jaquan Brisker, because weren't we the ones on him early on saying this kid's going to be unbelievable before we put a rating on him? So we were, we were, you know, I'm yeah. going to forget about everyone I got wrong, but let's point to that one. Um, but yeah, with JB Nelson, he's not your typical Juco in that he developed late or, you know, came out of nowhere or changed positions. Admittedly, and, and he's talked about this pretty openly, he just didn't take high school seriously from an academic standpoint. And so he wasn't even able to really be recruited because it, it was it was a non-starter on where he was. And so I give him a ton of credit. He goes to Lackawanna. JUCO is not – Lackawanna does a great job, right? Good facilities, all that other stuff. The JUCO life is not an easy life. No, and for him to get through there and continue to get better and work hard, you, you know, when you watch the film, you see the athleticism. And, yeah, I, I agree with you. Is he a left tackle? He's a left tackle. He's either performing really well or or Penn State's having issues at left tackle. But I could see him as a Me right first. tackle. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could see him as a guard, which is huge because now you, you got a guy that can play pretty much three positions on your offensive line. Um, and so for me, I'm excited to see how he develops just because of, of the growth he's shown at Lackawanna and, and the athleticism. When I look at offensive linemen, the first two things I, I look at is, you know, is he is he a T-Rex with, you know, short arms or does he have length or and is he athletic? And, and I think he's got some length and he's really athletic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's got a lot going. You know, we didn't see him at camp, but we heard about his camp performance, his, his testing numbers and things like that. And it really kind of popped. And and you look at what Penn State did on the offensive line this cycle, and there's a lot of question marks there. It's not, you know, you're not going to lie. You got Drew Shelton, um, who's a really, really good player, still has to fill out, obviously. Nelson, we just talked about. Uh, we will see if Penn State signs Andre Roy. Obviously, that's, uh, you know, as of, as of right now, it, it's very Can much up in the air. I mean, I yeah, I don't I don't know how to say it because yesterday I said on the podcast I thought he was gonna sign with Penn State. He told us he he was probably gonna sign with Penn State. And you know, you hear things and things happen, whatever. And then Malik McNeil, six seven, three forty. Um, those measurements are interesting because I'm not sure, you know, the six seven, every bit of six seven, uh three forty could be three twenty, could be three sixty, it's hard to say. Yeah. Uh, but he's a big boy. Yeah, and you and you look at it and and you and I saw it. You know some of the clips of him dunking. I'm surprised he didn't 
you know, pull a backboard down or something like that. Um, but he is so long and he's got some good athleticism from his basketball days. His footwork is good. I think from a technical standpoint, he's very raw and, and that's fine. I, I don't, I mean, you'd rather have raw than guys coming in with horrible habits. The, the kid can bend, um, and you just don't find human beings that big very often can move. And yeah, is he, he's a little bit of a project. He's also fits kind of, you know, the, the body type that Phil Troutwine likes in his offensive lineman. So there, there's a, I understand why Penn state was big on him. Malik also was a kid that did not want to, you know, travel far in recruiting and kept it quiet and was always going to stay close to home. Cause I, I think he's a either, either Bronx or Harlem. I can't remember which, but for me, he's really – look, this is what – this is the 2022 class. I'm, I'm really curious to see where he will be for the 2024 season, and I realize people think that's a long way away, but it's still something to keep an eye on. I just think it was very interesting when we talked and we covered this throughout the cycle. The offensive line recruiting um, obviously leaves something to be desired from a star standpoint, but from from you and I sort of digging in there and getting into it, I, I, I didn't see Phil Troutwine compromise on guys that maybe were a little bit higher that that weren't guys that he I don't want to say guys that he wanted, but guys that fit what he right. was looking for. And guys, you know, there were guys that Penn State right. fans thought that they were in for that really didn't have the interest level from the Penn State staff that they had from the Penn State fans. So I think that was a very interesting um, subplot to this entire offensive line class is you had guys that you know, maybe look good with stars and things like that, but they try really didn't break on those guys. No, I, I think that's a great point. He has his, whatever, you know, he, he has the mold that he wants his kids to be. You got to have some length. They got to be tall. They got to be athletic. He doesn't want, you know, you mentioned Malik McNeil, maybe, you know, it's probably about 340, 330 to 340, which, you know, he's six, seven. So that's a little different than if you're, you know, six, two at that size. And so it's exactly what you said. That's who that's who he targets. He wants kids like that. He wants kids that play multiple sports. There's a lot of different things that he wants done. And and I think he he did a good job, like you said, of staying true to himself and saying, okay, this is what we want at Penn State, and this is what we're going to be. Important is that uh, just you know just from a side, not even at Penn State, but all these schools that you cover. Obviously, the stars look great and everything like that. But if you're taking guys just because of stars, that's how you get in trouble. Well, that's how you get fired. I mean, you know, it is because, you know, it, it means and it doesn't mean we're we're right or wrong with it. It means that you're not taking guys that are based on your philosophy and what you fit, what will fit well in your program. You're just taking guys to take guys. And I think one thing that one thing I, I see when coaches start getting in trouble and, and they start having issues and you can kind of see and, and Fitz, we talk about it all the time. You can see when a program's in trouble about two years before they're actually in trouble on the field. And what happens is instead of taking good players or players they believe are good players and guys that they've really targeted, they start taking guys and convincing themselves that they're good players and they can be coached up. And, and when that starts to happen, you're in trouble. And so, yeah, going back to what you said, Penn, you know, Phil did a really good job of saying – this is what I want in an offensive lineman. Let me go find some. Yeah. And and, and you can say that about the entire class because you've got opportunities where, you know, Jaden Gold de decommits from USC, starts recruiting Penn State to try and take him, you know, as we thought Penn, we thought they were getting him in the summer and all of a sudden he, he commits to, to USC. I mean, that's it would be an easy picking, but Penn State stuck to their evaluation and, and you know, stayed. And I think you know, Nebraska is probably going to end up with Gold. So it's just a, a funny little subplot to how things go because if you if you stick on those things too hard then you you end up in trouble uh getting back to penn state's class a couple of guys that jumped out to me um just watching the film um you know maybe a little bit lower in the class and that's saying something because penn state's got a ton of four stars right. in this class right. um but tyler johnson i'm sure people receiver, won't focus on them on signing day but go ahead yeah no, no doubt no doubt uh tyler johnson the wide receiver from virginia mm. 
we, we look at this receiver class and you've got Caden Saunders and obviously you feel really good about him in the slot. Anthony Ivy's there, maybe Makai Flowers and Christian Driver. We see those guys as, as eventual safeties, but uh, you know, they're, we'll, we'll throw up some air quotes and go in there, but, and, and then Omari Evans, of course, is the speed guy. Tyler Johnson's kind of forgotten about plays in an area that doesn't get a ton of pub. doesn't, you know, the competition level is not that great, but right. he's got something in his film that just kind of makes you think, Maybe this balance is is I don't want to say elite, but maybe this balance is something that that turns him into a player, not like Jahan Dotson, but doesn't blow you away in any one facet, but just continues to make plays. Yeah, and I think when I look at a kid like him, first of all, his testing numbers were good, right? I mean, you're you're the you're yeah, the four four seven there, yeah. You have more the, than fast enough, yeah. I was gonna say you have the great memory and all that stuff. Um, and your 97 spreadsheets that go with it. But you you know how fast he is. You know his measurables. When I when I watch him on tape, he just makes a lot of really good plays. He makes plays look routine that maybe aren't routine. He gets out. He, he tracks the ball well. He catches everything. He's strong-handed. All the reports I got back from when he camped at Penn State was that it went really well. He was explosive in and out of his breaks. And listen – this is why, you know, I know people love to get caught up in the he's a 4-4 four, four kid or whatever. And when you look in the NFL, it's not like all these guys are running 4-4. Four, four. The most important thing to me as a receiver is, can you get out of your break and get separation in those two steps out of your break or that step out of your break before somebody can close on you again. And I feel like he can do that. I feel like his body is big enough to where he can shield some of the smaller corners that are playing against him. And I feel like he has just enough to, you know, is he going to be Amari Evans running those four fours or four threes down the field? No, but you, you don't have to. If you know how to run a route and if the quarterback can hold the safety, you can still stop and go and get down the field and make big plays. And so, you know, I know we love – you know, running the 10 sevens and everything, but you don't have to do that, especially with his size and, and his ball skills. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think we've gone 27 minutes here without talking about Drew Aller. Um, obviously oh. I think we'll probably, we'll probably wrap it up with, uh, he's signing? with talking about Drew. He, he, he's <laughs> signing. Yes. Uh, and I mean, five-star quarterback, obviously not a, none of these guys sure things because that's what we've seen. That's what the data shows throughout the time. But Penn State hasn't signed a quarterback like this. He's he's on a different level from everybody. He is. And I think one of the things that, you know, it's funny, this time of year, I wind up doing a lot of interviews with some publications that cover recruiting for these two days. And I, I kept going back to the same thing with Drew Alar. And it's, it's not to disrespect any other quarterbacks that they've signed, but, I mean, this kid is – I mean, he's he's a kid that should be the cornerstone of this offense for three years. And having Sean Clifford come back, that's great because Sean Clifford can help him. Sean Clifford's a good kid. I'm sure he'll help. Drew Alar can kind of get into the system a little bit more comfortably. But between the arm strength, his ability to throw on the move, he's not a dual threat, but he can run and, and make some yards with his feet to where you're going to have to account for him on some plays that break down. It, it's When you look at Penn State and, and what – they've really needed you, you want that quarterback with the big arm who can be the big time player and you also want you know somebody who can run an offense and and kind of okay now let's go get some offensive linemen and receivers and running backs i mean you can build a lot around this kid and like you said they, they just haven't had it before and a big part of that is there's not many kids that are like this i mean there's maybe one or two a class at the quarterback position like this and this year they got him. It's like going to the range and seeing a pro golfer out there, just kind of, you know, uh, setting himself apart from everyone else. It's really incredible to see him. Uh, you, you got a pun yourself you want to go with? I see your. Well, I, I was going to say, like, I, I used to play golf a lot and I was, I was good, right? For, for being, you know, and I would play once in a while with a guy who used to play in the PGA Tour. And I would be reminded that, you know, my 280 yard drive was nice, but when he was hitting, you know, his two iron that distance, <laughs> you just realize how much better they are than even somebody that in the general mass of things is considered good. It's why they're elite. I don't think anybody believes you drive at 280. So not anymore. Uh, I used to. 
All right. Uh, we're we're going to wrap it up here. I uh, just want to do a quick show on signing day morning to get people going. Uh, remember to check out lions247.com for uh, all your information. Follow the uh, the Andre Roy saga or whatever pops up. We're going to do a live show this evening at seven o'clock on YouTube, uh, on our Twitter account. Uh, Lance, our, our producer, Lance Glenn is going to distribute that everywhere it needs to be. But I encourage you to check it out. Tyler and I will be back. Um, we're going to kind of fly by the seat of our pants because that's this is our first live show. So we hope you join us. We'll send out the link for that. But uh, thank you for Brian Doan for joining it. Or thank you to Brian Doan for joining us uh, on the Lions 24-7 podcast for our signing day spectacular. Doan, enjoy signing day. Oh, that'll be stellar. All right. For Tyler Donahue, I'm Sean Fitz. Thank you for joining us on the Lions 24-7 podcast. And we'll see you later on Wednesday.